If you follow Dave Ramsey's 8% withdrawal rule, in some periods, you might be just fine, but in others, you might run out of money pretty quickly. In this video, I ended up back testing 20 starting points using an 8% withdrawal rate just to see how risky this advice really is. But I also want to talk about at the end some scenarios where an 8% starting rate of withdrawal might be completely acceptable. Before we jump in, let's look at the clip of Dave Ramsey talking about an 8% withdrawal rate. I mean, if you're well, making uh, 12 in good mutual funds and the S&P is average 11.8, and if inflation for the last 80 years has averaged 4%, if you make 12 and you need to leave 4% in there for inflation raises, that leaves you 8. So I'm perfectly comfortable drawing 8. But if you want to be a little bit conservative, 7. But sure not 5 or 3. So why don't we put that $1 million portfolio to the test using an 8% starting rate of withdrawal and see how long these portfolios survive. So first, let's talk about some of the parameters that I use for these back tests. First and foremost, the, the starting periods that I used in this video were from 1987 through 2006. Okay, So there are 20 periods where someone retires with a million dollar portfolio with an 8% starting rate of withdrawal. So, so 8% on a $1 million portfolio. And we wanna see, did the portfolio last 30 years? If it did, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna list the balance at the end of that 30 years. If it didn't, I'm gonna tell you how long that portfolio lasted until it was completely depleted. Now, obviously, the periods beginning in, from 1997 through 2006 do not have a full 30 years, but we're gonna see what the portfolio balance is at the end of the period tested, so in 2025, and I'm gonna ballpark how long I think that portfolio might have lasted going forward. Another important uh, thing to note is that we're gonna use an asset allocation of 75% in equities and 25% in fixed income. So this is important to note is because the portfolio that the famous Trinity study, the 4% rule used was a 50-50 portfolio, 50% 50 in stocks, 50% in bonds. But I think we could all agree that having a higher percentage in equities, okay, up to a certain degree does add value, does add long-term expected rate of return without hindering your ability to maintain your purchasing power and also protect against sequence of returns risk. But this is also a little different than what Dave Ramsey was talking about in his video where he said, quote unquote, a good mutual fund should be earning 12% a year. He also mentioned that the S&P 500 historically returns about 11%. So what he's saying is that those mutual funds that you might own will beat the S&P 500, which I'm a little skeptical of this, okay? I think maybe 10% of active funds actually beat the S&P 500 on a given year. And very few of those do this time in and time again, especially throughout a, a multiple decades in retirement. So why don't we look at the results? The first thing I wanna do is I wanna draw a line in between 1996 and 1997. The reason I'm gonna do that is because these periods of time over here, these have 30 year time horizons. If you start in 1987, we're gonna run that through 2016. If you started in 1996, we're gonna run that through 2025. Whereas 1997 and beyond, these do not have a 30 year time horizon, but we're still gonna list the portfolio balance at the end of, tw or in 2025 to determine, hey, how much is the portfolio at this point in time? Or if there's no money left in the portfolio, when did that portfolio run out? But if you look in this first phase over here, the periods of time where we do have 30 years tested, we have one, two, three, for five periods, five out of 10 were successful, okay? Now, successful in the sense that there was money left over after 30 years. But how successful is that if you have, let's say in 1987, if you have about $100,000 left over in the portfolio, what if you lived another year? The portfolio is very likely to be depleted by the 31st year. So is that successful? It depends. I would say... The successful trial in this situation is right here, which is 1991, where the portfolio value after 30 years had over $800,000. Now, obviously adjusted for inflation, this probably feels like a lot less than a million dollars or a lot less than 800,000 and some change, but you get my drift. This portfolio at least has a little bit of a buffer where it could, it, it could probably last another five, six, or even seven years until this portfolio is completely depleted. But if you think about that, that's only one trial out of the 10 
during this pretty pretty much a boom period in the 80s and 90s, the market was doing pretty well. Okay, if you go into phase two, we really had only one acceptable trial here. We had one acceptable trial. We had two that still had money left over after 25 years, but I mean that was less than two hundred thousand dollars. And so, if you have 21 years of retirement here in this scenario of 2004, you're not gonna you're not gonna make it past the 21st year. Your your portfolio is gonna be depleted in that 21st year. Same thing with 2006. Basically, your your portfolio lasted 19 years. In the 2003 scenario, okay, now we have 22 years in retirement. You have basically a million dollars, so you could probably you could probably argue that this portfolio would last another 10 years beyond year 30 or beyond year 32. But that was really the only scenario here in this second phase where this was a successful outcome, starting with an 8% rate of withdrawal. Now, obviously, a lot of these scenarios, there was no money left over at the end of the time period. And so just to run through a few of these examples, 1989, the portfolio lasted 26 years. 1990, the portfolio lasted 21 years. 1992, the portfolio lasted 26 years. 1994, the portfolio lasted 25 years. 1996, the portfolio lasted 22 years. 1997, 21. We had 17, 14, 12, 14, 20. Okay, not very good. 2005, what did that? What was that? 19 years. Okay, so the portfolio was just depleted. If you average all of the portfolios in terms of how long they either lasted or were expected to last during the duration of that 30-year period or more, the average was about 23.65. So a little over 23 years was the average time horizon for a portfolio to survive, starting with an 8% rate of withdrawal. So if your time horizon isn't super long, okay, Let's say you retire at 70 or 75 and you don't have a lot of longevity on your side, starting with an 8% withdrawal actually probably could work out just fine because you're not going to worry about that 30-year time horizon. Of course, if you're married and your spouse is maybe a few years younger or maybe your spouse has longevity on their side and they could potentially live 30 years, you need to factor in not just your life expectancy but also your spouse's life expectancy. So what if you must start with an 8% rate of withdrawal? Maybe you're forced into retirement, or maybe you're in that scenario where maybe longevity, you don't have a ton of longevity, and you're not really too worried about maximizing your financial legacy. So if you die with nothing, you're not super concerned. Obviously, there's a lot of risk there, but if you need to start with an 8% rate of withdrawal, here are some things I'd recommend you consider. Number one, most importantly, is develop a sound investment strategy. What got you here is not going to get you there. And more importantly, rules of thumb in terms of how you invest your portfolio in retirement versus pre-retirement, you need to really throw those out the window, okay? If you're going to be starting with a more aggressive rate of withdrawal, you can't be super conservative. You can't be 30 or 40 or even 50% in stocks. You need to have a higher allocation to equities. So therefore, you must be able to stomach the ups and downs of the market more so than a traditional retiree who might be 60% in equities or even 50% in equities, Okay. But Bill Bengen, with his Trinity study, I love what he said, which is, um, yes, he used the 50-50 allocation for his 4% rule, his famous 4% rule, but he suggested, if you can stomach it, get as close as possible to 75-25, 75% in equities, 25% in fixed income. The second thing is maximize your tax efficiency. None of these studies, Trinity study included, this back test does not factor in taxes, okay? And if you have a very tax-efficient plan, whether it's a, a combination of taxable accounts with tax deferred and tax free or HSAs. Uh, if you have a solid investment strategy that also is tax efficient from an income distribution standpoint, that will add more value to your rate of withdrawal on an after tax basis. Number three is consider the bridge period. Okay. The bridge period is the time when you retire where you have that income gap up until you start taking Social Security. So maybe your bridge period, you do start with an 8% rate of withdrawal, but maybe it's only five years or six years or even seven years until Social Security kicks in. In that scenario, you could potentially start with an 8% rate of withdrawal knowing that that might be cut in half when you start that Social Security income, whether it's at full retirement age or if you decided to delay it up until age 70. Another thing which is very important is to consider this idea of risk-based guardrails. Guardrails, this is one of the most uh, uh, popular frameworks for retirement income planners out there, which is this idea that 
your rate of withdrawal does not have to be static. It doesn't have to be a set it and forget it. You can have a flexible withdrawal strategy. And, and one of the things that you might consider is making cuts if the market does drop. And this is what's called the portfolio rescue rule. This states that if your rate of withdrawal increases by 20% over and above the way it started, just because the market forces drove your portfolio value down, you might cut your spending by 10% or cut your rate of withdrawal by 10%. Studies have shown with the Guyton Klinger study that this does help preserve and protect portfolio longevity in the event you do run into those sequence of returns risks. But another thing in here, which is this inflation rule, can be directly corresponded with this. Adjust your inflation withdrawal. So in the scenario that we looked at, the back testing that we just looked at, we're assuming each and every year this individual is essentially adjusting the rate of withdrawal or their, their withdrawal dollar amount by inflation. So if inflation was 3%, you're going to increase that in, uh, withdrawal by 3%. But studies have shown that retirees actually lag inflation by about 1% a year. So another thing you might do to protect against this if you're starting with a higher rate of withdrawal is either potentially giving you no inflation raises during down years. This is actually the inflation rule here in the guardrail framework. So let's say you have a down year in the markets, don't give yourself an inflation raise. But another thing to do is maybe don't adjust your portfolio withdrawals by inflation each and every year. Let's say inflation's 3%, going with that same framework, maybe you only increase your portfolio withdrawal by 2%, okay? Or maybe you sort of introduce some sort of uh, framework of, of spending phases. You've got three distinct ph phases of the go-go years, the slow-go years, and the no-go years. Maybe each phase you cut your spending by 10% or 15% or even 20% because maybe you're not traveling as much or maybe you're not go going as much as you were early on in retirement, later in retirement. Another consideration is really thinking through, does it make sense to have some kind of annuity income or, or SPIA, which stands for single premium immediate annuity? I know a lot of people are anti-annuity, but SPIA rates, depending on your age and depending on if you have a joint annuitant, those could be in the 7 or even 8% payout range, depending on what kind of product you have. So if you need an 8% starting withdrawal, instead of having all of your portfolio in the market and hoping that the markets play out well over the first three, four, or five years in retirement, maybe a portion of your assets are carved out into a SPIA to maximize income from that bucket and therefore allowing you to be a little bit more aggressive with the remaining assets on your portfolio. And then, of course, last but not least, consider maybe working another year or two years or maybe even working part-time in retirement. Adding that extra income in retirement to reduce that rate of withdrawal will absolutely help out, especially if you run into the sequence of returns risk where maybe you go through a downturn, a correction, or, or a bear market in those first two to three years of retirement. That additional income could really hedge against that risk and add longevity to your portfolio. I hope you guys found this helpful. And listen, if you're over 50, you've saved in excess of seven figures, and you're looking to fire your boss and maximize your retirement income, minimize your lifetime tax bill, and worry less about money, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And make sure also to follow our podcast wherever you consume podcasts. And, and also, if you're approaching retirement and you want to know what a withdrawal strategy might look like for your situation, this is what we do on a day in and day out basis. If you want to learn a little bit more about working with us, you can visit our website at www.imaginefinancialsecurity.com or you can start with the retirement readiness questionnaire that is linked in the description of this episode. We'd love to hear from you and see how we can help you plan for and execute a successful retirement. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until next week, this is Kevin Lyle signing off.